Hello, welcome to the conference. Uh, welcome to this um, session on, on feral swine. I'm really happy to be here with you all today. And hey, in case you didn't realize it, happy Earth Day to you, it's Earth Day. Um, I really wish that we could all be there in glorious Stevens Point, Wisconsin, where I got my undergrad. Um, so we could be celebrating, appreciating the day together, seeing each other face to face, and enjoying a point beer or two. That sounds really good to me right now. Um, I want to bring up the Earth Day issue because what we're talking about today, our conference, really fits into this. I learned about Earth Day when I was a student, an undergraduate student at Stevens Point. It was established in 1970 by Wisconsin Senator Gaylord Nelson, who actually won the Presidential Medal of Freedom for um, initiating Earth Day. It's an annual event, and back in Nelson's day, the reason that how this how it manifested was related to remember the book Silent Spring, DDT and pesticides impacting our bird populations. That's where it all started. Um, more recently, Earth Day's been, been centered on other big issues like climate change. The Paris Agreement was signed in the US um, to work globally to address climate change on, on Earth Day. I know this year, President Biden is gonna be meeting with 40 world leaders talking, talking about climate issues of today. I think it's very apt that our session is occurring today as our topic related to invasive species greatly impacting our environment um, really does kind of fit the day. And I'm glad that we're all in this together because it's going to take a team. My co-presenter today is Dr. Um, Jack Mayer. He's also in the other session on wild pigs today giving, and giving a talk. And what we're going to discuss for you is invasive wild pigs in North America, past, present, and future. And Jack, he's just the, the Pope of Pigs. Dr. Mayer is with the Savannah River National Ecology Lab, and he's been working on, on pigs since his graduate student days in the early 70s. So he really is the guy. Um, and me, I'm, well, I guess I'm, people call me the pig guy, so I'm just a pig guy. Um, I'm Kurt Burkwadrin, I'm with the National Wildlife Research Center. Um, which is the research branch of USDA APHIS Wildlife Services. And so if pigs are part of your day job, you can kind of tune out. I'll just reiterate some stuff that you already know until I get more toward the end. And then I'll send you home with some new tidbits. If, if you're kind of new to pigs, that's why I want to go back and talk about the, the past, where we've been, how we got into this situation, um, where we're at now, and where we're going. You're going to go home uh, knowing a lot more about wild pigs than when you first arrive, arrived here. And I've got a picture on the right side here of this really newest book. It's been out for a year. But um, if you don't have this book yet and you're into pigs, one time offer. The first five students that email me after this presentation, I'm going to send you a copy of this book. So the situation, wild pigs are, you know, genus species Suscrofa. It's the same genus and species as domestic pigs. Um, they aren't native to the U.S., however, they've been present here for centuries. They arrived when Europeans arrived on this continent. And after decades of stable numbers and distribution, invasive wild pig populations have really exploded across this, this country. Um, the maps here show where, what's marked in blue. That's where our pig populations were in the early 80s. Then you shift over here, the latest copy of this map is from 2018. You can see how much they just, just exploded here in, in the last 40 years um, or so. And along with increasing pig numbers comes increasing damages and a wide variety of damages. So as Dr. Mayer has said, the pig bomb went off and here's how that happened. So I said, they're, they're such scrofa. They all started the same as our Eurasian wild boar. And then through domestication processes, which started about 15,000 year, years ago, um, through human intervention, right? We got our domestic pigs, um, higher reproductive rates, uh, changes in the animals, so that by the time that we were looking for the new world, we brought um, our domestic pigs with us the same time or shortly thereafter, actually, Eurasian wild boar were also introduced for like hunting purposes um, into to North America. And so 
um, domestic pigs that kind of got away, feralized. Of course, there weren't open water fences at that time, right? It was all open range. They became feral, crossing with raisin wild boar. You get these, these hybrids. So all three of these populations, subpopulations, I should say, because they're all Suscrofa, is where we got our wild pigs from. And it's been said um, that wild pigs are just the, the perfect invasive animal species. And it's true, you know, they're smart, they're very adaptable survivors. Um, other work that I've done in my career before I got so involved with pigs is I've done a lot of rodent work. I've done a lot of, of work on deer. And every time that I try to compare pigs to either, I'm wrong. They aren't are selected, nor are they case selected. I think they're just more survive and thrive selected. You know, they can live about anywhere. They can eat about anything. They've got few effective natural predators and they've got very high reproductive rates, high reproductive potential. And along with that comes extensive damage. And they're just tough. They're difficult to control and difficult to eradicate. And how'd they get here? Well, the first introductions into the US was actually in Hawaii as early as, as the um, 1200s. The first introductions um, onto uh, the lower 48 were, you know, they, they came with Columbus actually. So as soon as, as we first stepped um, on the continent, as Europeans stepped on the continent, they had pigs with them. So, it's, so their introductions are contemporary, contemporaneous with all early exploration and colonization. Um, like I said, it was domestic swine, bar long as a, as a source of meat, uh, released and able to, to um, grow up and, and spread throughout um, the, the country. So the map here on the bottom shows how the pigs in, in Hawaii um, came from, from west to east. Um, with the Polynesians and then the others came from, from Europe to the mainland of, of the US. And these domestic pigs were widely introduced in the European colonies throughout the, the southeastern US, the, actually I should say the whole eastern seaboard and into the, into the Southwest. Um, we, because of these free range livestock practices, that's what kind of led to these establishment of these feral populations. And um, there's a, Kind of an era, if you get into the agricultural literature, an era of hog rights, it was called, where it was ear notching that was used to, um, to denote ownership. You know, pre ear tags, everybody would gather up their pigs, they, they'd get the piglets when they're real tiny, notch their ears in unique ways, release them, and then go pick them up when it's time to bring them to market. This is kind of how it was done. So it's easy to see how several pigs would get away and, and be able to get themselves established. Um, early on, there, there weren't tons of reports of damage, but you can find reports of damage um, as early as, as the 1600s. Um, in Virginia, North Carolina, there's reports of, of damage. And I think I got in an, an upcoming slide. There's that in, in Spain, the, the queen was directing people in the US um, well, the new world to control the wild pigs. But as you can see, they were quite widespread by the early 1900s in as many as 27 states by the end of the 1800s. And then, and so that's for the domestics, right? And now for the Eurasian wild boar, they too were um, introduced quite early. Um, introduction started in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. There was introductions of, of pure Eurasian wild boar. Most of them were being brought into fenced enclosures for hunting purposes. Um, and anybody who's worked with, with um, feral pigs, and especially the, the pure Eurasians, keeping them behind a fence is not easy. A fence that's built for whitetails is not gonna keep wild boar in for very long. I've seen this several times in my work throughout the years, especially in Michigan with the population um, facilities. So although they were brought into fence enclosures, they didn't stay there. Um, some escaped from just about every place that they were originally brought into. Those that did stay behind the fence were very prolific. So they were um, uh, shared with others, spread across the country. So there was a lot of secondary introductions that occurred. There was, and still is, a lot of illegal intra and interstate translocations of, of wild pigs and releases. Um, active stocking in, in some areas. And of course, 
as these ones get introduced into the wild, they're hybridizing with those, those feral um, swine of domestic lineage. And some of these, it's, it's amazing to see that some of these introductions are really quite, quite recent. Um, in Canada, for example, as, as recent as, as just 10 years ago, through their um, agricultural departments, they were promoting wild boar as an alternative form of, of agriculture. But as they get out, and that really didn't take off for them, now they've got the problem of, of wild boar being established in several provinces, even threatening coming into North Dakota and Saskatchewan. And there's a poster session by Corey Kramer, a poster in the poster session by Corey Kramer that you'll have to catch and see to learn more about, about those pigs. So at present, there are 26 states that have established populations of wild pigs. Seven states have emerging reports of wild pigs. So we're using targeted removals and monitoring to keep an eye on that. There are 11 states that are considered pig-free right now where we're just doing monitoring um, to determine any, any new presence of, of wild pigs. Six states um, have no pigs. And they've never been reported in just two states, Rhode Island and Wyoming. The estimates right now are that there are about 7 million pigs in the US. Um, those estimates range depending on, on the analysis um, from, from as low as four to as high as 11 million pigs. And there's been a lot of good effort put into determining those populations, where they are, where they're likely to expand in the absence of our um, responsible management. And the fact that we've got so many solid mapping efforts and modeling efforts all kind of saying the same thing gives us confidence that without our, our um, control and our, our effort, the absence of us doing something about it, these populations will really just continue to explode. The densities will increase, and the ranges will expand. And as I get into this more, you'll see that we're already curtailing that sum. So we're, we're starting to uh, bring the trajectory back down. And of course, yeah, with increasing populations and spreading populations come damages. And the damages that pigs do are really, really quite widespread from damaging crops, of course. And there aren't many crops that pigs don't take a liking to. Um, there's been some that I've heard like, oh, they don't really like cotton that much, but then we'll see them going in the cotton. And maybe they aren't going in there for the cotton, but because cotton's irrigated, so there's insects and grubs and things associated with it, they're in there destroying the cotton. Um, they can cause impacts to livestock, pets, and people um, directly by depredating young livestock, uh, hurting pets. There's, it was in the news last year, last fall, a woman in Texas got killed by wild pigs. So besides, so you know, real um, important kind of, of impacts as well as disease impacts. You know, so they can also be transferring disease to animals and people and pets. So. They'll damage any kind of property that they seem that they're crossing at the time. They'll damage cultural resources, any kind of infrastructure, natural habitats. They've got impacts on all kinds of, of wildlife. Everywhere that I that I work on a lot of military bases and some fish and wildlife service um, refuges, the impacts that they have on, on native flora and fauna, sometimes T and E species, um, is really immense. And they're also leak, bleeding on over into the urban areas. Um, to the point that they're going to be like our next urban coyotes or urban bears. Part of the challenges that we have, and there's a few of them I'm going to touch up on here, is wild pigs are just fun. Um, hunting wild pigs is fun. There's no denying it. So it's become a popular sport. And as it took off as a more popular sport, just like white-tailed deer hunting kind of went from being something that you did with family and friends to being kind of an industry with so many magazines and, and so much media around it, pigs have been the same way to the point that they're the second most popular big game species in the US. In the state of Mississippi, they're the number one um, big game species. So it's popular, pigs are popular. There's a lot of marketing as you can see from my uh, little screenshots here, uh, social media um, around it, advertised, it's kind of glam glamorized and there's, several uh, magazines and, and I'll listen to podcasts and things, but I'm sure there's a lot of, of web presence um, around wild pigs. But a lot of it talks about 
you know, helping the cause of reducing populations. Um, but recreational hunting really is not, you know, it's, it's, it's good to, to be taking pigs off the landscape, but hunting at the level that's being done is really not gonna help us solve the problem. In some cases, it's actually doing just the opposite. Partly because it's, it's helping to grow a private industry. We need to kind of curtail this because once there's economics tied to it, um, people are making a living related to it. Well, then they have incentive to, to keep that living going, right? And they'll be going to their congressmen saying, hey, we need to keep these pigs on the landscape. They're free to my family, right? So we have to realize those sorts of things. And these niche markets are getting established in some areas and curtailed in others. So there's progress being made here, um, but there's, there's professional pig removal services, um, products that can be bought, different kinds of baits and lures to get them in the traps and things like that. Recreational services, for example, there's people who are making a living with um, offering helicopter gunning experiences. So a hunter can, can pay to have the experience of going in a helicopter and, and gunning pigs. And although you might have a warm fuzzy that you're having to control that population, you think that the owner of that company really wants to control that population to the point that he doesn't have business for next year's clients? You know, of course not. And in some areas, especially in the Southeast, um, the wild pigs can really be part of the local culture. So we've got to take that into consideration. You know, there's, there's a human dimensions um, aspect to this. Uh, in areas where, where they're real well ingrained, um, we can't be thinking, we need to think more about controlling numbers so that we're reducing damage to agricultural resources um, at, at this stage and maybe not much more than that. But that itself is an is a immense task. As you travel in some areas of, of Texas, and I enjoy this, I get into this too. There's festivals um, around wild pigs. You check out this um, bottom left picture. They've got invasive feral swine portrayed to be just as American as baseball and apple pie, you know? Where we can make the most progress right now in the short term is in areas where wild pigs aren't as ingrained in, in the culture. It's easier where pigs haven't been present for as long, um, of course. So I can say like Michigan, for example, we're able to work with the Michigan United Conservation Club. This is being led by um, our wildlife services team in, in Michigan and the Michigan DNR to help champion kind of an anti-pig atti attitude, which led to some positive messaging and encouraging members to, to report pigs. So like I say, it's easier to do this in areas where pigs aren't part of the culture yet. And so we're having success in those states than, than eradicating, eliminating pigs. So given all these challenges, how realistic is it for us to really make a difference? Well, I'd argue that, that we can make a difference because, because there's a will and there's a way. And of course, along with that, you've got to pay the price. You've got to work for it. Nothing is free. And in this profession, we're used to this. And um, I'm proud to say that we're well on our way here and really doing well in that with invasive wild pigs, with a congressional directive in 2014 to start addressing the issue, um, that let us see that there is a public, there is a political will to address this issue. So with the development of the USDA's National Feral Swine Damage Management Program, and then working with, with other federal and state ag agencies, we've been able to grow some awareness with respect to the problem and work on national, state, and local scales. Some of the way is that even with um, this influx of, of interest and, and effort and funding, we've been able to capitalize on even on more funding. So currently, the farm in, in the Farm Bill, we're able to establish these pilot projects where um, wildlife services, along with the NRCS, can work with, with states and universities to do pilot projects to demonstrate that we can go in and we can take pigs off the landscape. And then um, our economics team demonstrates the impact of that, you know, how much um, re resources are being saved, the benefits of it. And the hope is that then they'll just kind of steamroll and other landowners will, will see the positive impacts of, of letting us go in and remove pigs um, so that they too can have those, those benefits. So there's a way. And there's been good progress towards eradication. The states listed 
Um, and in yellow are detection states. Gray states, we believe that the pigs have all been eliminated or never, or never had pigs. Um, so we're in pretty good shape in some of these areas. Of course, that's not even gonna be the goal to, um, to eradicate in some states in the Southeast in Texas and Oklahoma. They will target just making sure that we're doing a lot to prevent, reduce damage to agricultural interests. And in pretty short order, we've really improved our tools and we're on the verge of improving our tools that are needed to control invasive wild, wild pig. For example, um, the detoxicants called sodium nitrite, Hogon is going to be the uh, um, brand name. We're two studies away that if everything goes well for us, we'll be able to submit a package to um, the EPA so that in a couple of years, that product could be registered, toxicant for, for feral swine. There's another toxicant, um, Kaput, warfarin-based, that is registered, that just needs a, probably a few more um, research steps to give us some confidence that it too could be a valuable tool in controlling wild pigs. So those two are right on the cusp of being used. Trapping has really improved. You know, there's, you're always building a better mouse trap. Well, there's been innovative people building better pig traps. And a lot of us have been using smart traps in recent years to the point that, that I could be sitting home on the couch uh, watching TV with the family, watching my phone with one eye, so that when I can see that all the pigs are in a trap, I can push the button and from my couch in Fort Collins, Colorado, I can be dropping a gate in California or in Texas or in Alabama to catch all those pigs to let the guys know in the morning to, to go take care of them. Um, for, for me as a researcher, that means we usually go and empower them. Operationally, you can go and legally remove, remove them. Um, another new trap of Want to highlight is up here in the upper right. This is the pig brig. So White Buffalo, Troy Dean Cole and his crew, they they've just invented this trap and wildlife services helped them some to kind of perfect it. And we just use it for the first time. My crew had this had these traps in Hawaii last week, and in the course of a week and a half, um, they they're believers. We've really had some nice success with these traps that are easier to to move and through the jungle and rough terrain and things. Um, they work real well for us, and so those are available now too. Other kinds of improvements that we're taking advantage of would be um, all the night vision kind of tools that are out there now for use on the ground, for use from the air, um, improved ammunition and wildlife services. We're using all non-toxic um, ammunition and doing studies to determine what ammunitions are most effective and even working with ma ammunition manufacturers to optimize the ammunition for, for our use on the ground as well as for use from aerial gunning from helicopters. But we're doing studies to figure out what are the best attractants um, to get pigs into traps, to get pigs to toxic sites. Uh, all kinds of effort going into making ourselves more efficient. And there's been work done relative to human dimensions to learn more about public perceptions and to help people realize the breadth of the problems associated with, with invasive wild pigs. So we're increasing the, the public awareness um, and I think I mentioned a bit earlier too, but and it goes beyond just rural rural impacts is there's more and more urban pigs. This picture here, actually, I took this in Berlin. Um, even in their native countries, uh, these animals are encroaching on urban areas. And part of the of, of our efforts here relate to task forces, task forces at many levels. A lot of us old deer guys learned a lot with, with urban deer hunts of how do you um, get local communities and things to, to accept the need for hunts and get everybody, all, everybody together at the table, um, talking about all the pros and cons and coming to agreements to move forward. So um, all the states with wildlife services programs um, addressing wild pigs have task forces, including agricultural interests, the wildlife um, agencies, and we, we ramp this up to state, state levels and regional levels, as well as international. So we're working with Canada, working with Mexico, working with tribal nations to work across the continent to address wild pig issues. And it's been really been good in that the information that we're getting out there is really increasing public support. Um, some of the strategies related to these task forces are to have are to have shared goals and dispense clear common messaging. Um, the educational materials are are increasing and really improving. 
And some of the things that we're trying to do is establish these task forces, um, like best management practices, for example, so that we're all kind of singing from the same sheet of music, all using this, the same tools, adapting them to our local situations, but um, uh, really leveraging uh, what we know so that others can benefit from it too. So one of the main action items, of course, is improving knowledge and the amount of, of knowledge that's, that's rolling in on wild pigs as we kind of learn more about the enemy is really increasing. What I tell my team is, is being a wild pig biologist in 2021 today is like being a deer biologist in 1970. Everybody cares, there's a lot of interest, there's, there's a lot of need, so, and there's a lot of questions to answer. So it's an exciting time to be a researcher. So there's a lot of work that's going on. Um, there's, there's funding to be able to address these, these issues so that we can do really good and proper studies. And all this um, new knowledge then can be used to improve decisions, um, to help uh, policy, policymakers make good decisions and help managers on the ground do their jobs more efficiently. Of course, a goal is gonna to have to be to, to maintain and secure this long-term funding because feral swine control um, is not going to be a sprint, it's a marathon, right? It's, it's gonna take, take a while. It'll take support, um, continue legislative action for us to be able to continue um, making this, this impact. One of the angles that we have to be thinking about is improving our access to private lands. And as we get to work on some properties, sometimes the neighbors don't let us on, on their properties. So as they, they learn about our efficiency and the ills of wild pigs, hopefully we get, we get on more properties and just keep on chipping away and making more and more progress. It's going to really be a coordinated um, effort. But do I think we can do it? Yes, I really do think we can do it. Collectively, we're already making steady progress and substantial progress. And it's what we do in our profession, right? We're wildlife biologists. We get to work, we keep working, we don't stop. We, we adapt, we just keep at it, and we do have success. Look at how we brought those deer numbers back, right? Um, let me go on to that slide. I showed this slide twice before, uh, so I should probably retire it after this presentation. But I think it's, it's interesting and telling for, to note where our deer populations are now and where they were back 120 years ago. We had next to you know, less than a million deer, white-tailed deer, and less than a million pigs at that time. And then through um, the prohibition on hunting for a while, as we then had our profession start, right? So by 1943, um, the first book on wildlife management, game management by Olga Leopold, um, University of Wisconsin-Madison. If we were there at the conference, we'd all be going to see out Leopold's shack. Um, but through our efforts, through conservationists, um, early career uh, wildlife professionals, early in the, uh, history of our profession, we brought these deer populations back and we all took population dynamics. So we know about these exponential growth curves and we see that pigs are starting to, to, to go there. And now our, our mission is opposite of what it used to be, growing these deer numbers up. We want to curtail these pig numbers. So can we do it? Yes, of course we can do it. Look at what we did with our own deer, right? So when Europeans arrived in, in the, the US, uh, the continent around the year 1500, we had 30 million deer um, on the continent. And then through market hunting and then really intensive market hunting. So we had people who were hungry and had the will, could be making a buck uh, um, off of, off of white-tailed deer. We brought these numbers way down. Of course, other things played a role too, like habitat change, logging and things. But, but look at what we did before all the tools I just described. This is before helicopters and before you know, high-powered scopes and night vision. And we were able to decimate our deer populations without even hardly trying. So surely we can bring these deer, these pig populations into check. And of course, as wildlifers, we talk a lot about the North American model of wildlife management. Don't forget, pigs do not apply. Pigs are invasive species. So the North American model, I will argue, does not apply to them. So with that, I'd like to... Um, Thank you for, for attending. I know towards the end of the session, we'll have time for some discussion. I hope that we've generated some discussion. Thanks, I appreciate it.